This is the first of two videos that focus on setting up and then solving a finite element analysis problem using frame elements. And this first video focuses on the setup process. This is the problem that we're going to be tackling. As you can see, we've got a horizontal beam that's 15 feet long and then an angled beam at 45 degrees that uh, lifts up 10 feet above the ground. We have a distributed load applied to the angled beam and where our goal is to find the deflection stresses and reactions present in this steel frame. We've got a modulus, cross-sectional area, and moment of inertia for the two beams. They are the same properties for the two. So first step here is to choose our model arrangement. So this problem lends itself to two elements, one at an angle and one horizontal. So I've identified those as well as choosing node numbering. In addition, as you can see, I've calculated what the length of the two frame members will be in inches so that I can be consistent with my units. And I've also chosen an orientation for the elements. In other words, um, element one, I know is going to have a positive angle between zero and 90 degrees. In fact, I know it's going to be 45 degrees. Element two is simply going to have an angle to the global x-axis of zero. In addition, I can identify my boundary conditions. So at node one, I know that I can not translate in either direction and I can have no rotation. I didn't state that explicitly, but in this case, I'm assuming both ends are built in. Um, so by that same token at node three, no translations and no rotations. Finally, um, just to, to clarify, the distributed load is a linear relationship where the peak value is W naught and it's going to be in units of force per length. Um, so the distribution is just going to be W equals W naught X prime divided by L1. That's going to be in the local coordinate system. That's what the prime represents there. And notice that even though this is a vertical loading in the global system, it will produce both axial and transverse loads on this angled member. That's going to introduce a little bit of a challenge in our calculation process. We'll start out, as always, by identifying the stiffness matrices for the two elements. This matrix was developed in a prior video. It shows um, cosines and sines in addition to the material properties and cross-sectional properties of the frame element. So this is the, the biggie for the frame. This is a 2D frame which has axial, transverse, and rotational degrees of freedom. So to find what the stiffness matrix actually is for element one, we need to evaluate the sine and cosine. Of course, they are one over square root of two or square root of two over two. That means that when I multiply any of those two by each other, I'm just gonna get a half. That simplifies things a bit. So our simplified matrix is now shown. Um, at least we got rid of the S's and the C's. Still a lot of information in this element one stiffness matrix. Let's move on to element two. Again, we start with the same matrix, but now because element two is aligned with the global x-axis, the angle is zero degrees, so cosine is one and sine is zero. That gives us a much more simpler setup for the stiffness matrix for element two. Now that we have our two element stiffness matrices, we can assemble the global stiffness matrix. But before I jump into that, let's notice here that I've got a total of nine degrees of freedom. That means that my global stiffness matrix is going to be a nine by nine matrix. And as we can tell from the complexity of the element one stiffness matrix, it's gonna be pretty messy. So when I'm solving a problem by hand, at this point, I usually try to um, determine what exactly I need to know. I'm gonna take this element one stiffness matrix, add in the degrees of freedom for the rows and the columns, then I identify element two stiffness matrix, add in the degrees of freedom, and now I ask myself, what do I really need to know? And to solve for displacements, what I need to know are the terms in this stiffness matrix that are associated with the unknown degrees of freedom. So which ones are those? Well, remember that we have boundary conditions that at nodes one and three, all of our degrees of freedom are zero. So that means the only terms in these matrices I need to solve for displacement are the terms that I've circled here, the ones that are associated with node two. 
Now, if I want to go back at the end and find reactions, I'm going to need more of these matrices. But for now, this is the only portion that I need. So this is what I'll move forward with, the three by three matrix that's the sum of these two. So let's assemble a global stiffness matrix with the boundary conditions applied. In other words, just the portion of the stiffness matrix that affects the unknown degrees of freedom. So for element one, that was the three by three here. For element two, it was this three by three. When I add them together, I want to make sure that I get all of the terms in the right rows and columns. This is a pretty straightforward one. We can see the rows and columns align association with degree of freedom is the same for these two. So it's simply a matter of adding the individual terms together, just as if I added the two matrices directly. And that gives me the expression here. Now you might notice that the coefficient out front in these matrices changed a little bit. What I did is I, I brought the L, L terms inside of the matrix so that I could more easily add them as you see here. But this then gives me the global stiffness matrix with the boundary conditions applied. You can see that the first two terms for in the upper left came from element one and the next term came from element two. And if you look through each of the cells of this combined matrix, you will find that all the terms added. Once I have my global stiffness matrix, the next step is to find my global force vector. And to do that, I need to compile all of my point loads as well as my nodal equivalent forces that come from the distributed loads. In this case, element one does have a distributed load, so I need to calculate the equivalent nodal force vector there. I have the expression here shown for body forces, so I've chosen to use a body force to represent the distributed. Remember for beams I could choose body or surface, either one is fine. Once we get to 2D there will be a distinction between these. Now I added primes to this expression just to remind us that that body force vector needs to show up in local coordinates. And local coordinates are important because W as shown here is vertical. And if I just used it as a vertical force, and kept it in the global system, then I would think that I only had a transverse force added to this beam. But in fact, because the beam is at an angle, vertical force produces an axial load inside of the beam. So I need to do some transformation. I can do it one of two ways. I can either convert using the formal transformation matrix, the uh, force vector, or I can look at this force and break it into two components, one parallel to the beam and one perpendicular. So I'm going to show you the formal method. First off, we want to write our body force term in its global coordinates simply by looking at W and expressing that as W divided by cross-sectional area and then in the negative direction. And of course, we then also say that there is no global X component or global rotary component. Now, applying to transformation to get a transformed or a local coordinate version of the body force, I have a transformation matrix. But notice that the body force vector is a three term vector as it is in local and global coordinates. So I just need the upper left corner of the transformation matrix that I used for degrees of freedom. So hopefully that looks familiar to you. Take that matrix, multiply it by the body force vector in global coordinates, recognize that cosine and sine are each one over the square root of two, and that gives me the body force vector in local coordinates. Now again, that's the formal method. You could alternately have simply converted uh, W into transverse and parallel components, and you would have ended up with the same local coordinate body force vector. So now I can actually apply this integral expression here. I'm looking for the body force vector um, or I'm sorry, the equivalent nodal force vector that comes from that body force vector. That equivalent nodal force vector is going to have terms for all of the potential forces in the, um, at each node of the beam here. So I've got an F1X prime, an F1Y prime, an M1, F2X prime, F2Y prime, and M2. These terms are what I'm solving for in the integral expression. So I'm going to have the integral of the transpose of the shape function matrix. This is the transpose of the shape function matrix multiplied by the body force vector. And then I'm going to convert my um, integrand or, or the differential over the volume into the cross-sectional area times differential along the length. 
evaluate those expressions. So I multiply out the matrices um, and I get a column matrix or a column vector. And then I have to plug in the values for each of the shape functions. Once I plug those values in, I get this expression now and I need to integrate each one of these terms and in the end I get these expressions for the distributed or the nodal forces that represent that distributed load. It's a bit of a lengthy process. I want to talk about what this means. Um, if we look at each one of these terms we can actually draw them on the local coordinate system for the beam. So if here's my beam if I look at the X direction forces, this is telling me that I have a force one sixth on the left and one third on the right. So I have double the axial force acting on the right hand side. That's remember with our, our force there, it gets larger as I go to the right hand side of the beam. So that makes sense. When I look at the Y direction, again, I have two Y components of the force, both acting downward as I expect. And then I also have rotational terms, um, both at the right and the left. So this is the force distribution at the nodes that represents the triangular shape uh, vertical force that I am trying to capture in this model. So we're almost done with the setup now. We have a nodal force vector for element one that is in the local coordinate system. So we need to convert it back to global. In order to do that conversion, I need to invert this equation. So give me my force vector in global coordinates from the one in local. So I need the inverse of the transformation matrix. This is the full transformation matrix that I used for degrees of freedom because it has to be a six by six because now we're talking about the nodal force vector. Now the, the inverse of a transformation, a rotation matrix is simply the transpose. So that's what I've got here. This is the transpose of the matrix T that we use for degrees of freedom. So I've plugged in what F prime is equal to. Now I simply need to add the fact that uh, cosine and sine are each one over the square root of two. I do that step here. That gives me a new transformation matrix. And then I can evaluate or multiply the matrix times the force vector. And that gives me the force vector in global coordinates. So now I'm ready to assemble this with any point loads in the system and it will give me the final uh, system force vector and I'm ready to do solution. Let's take a quick look at what we see here in the terms. The net horizontal force and the net moment are zero. So that's interesting. If I add the, the two X force terms, they're gonna to drop to zero. If I add the two moment terms, they go away. And we would expect this because there is no, I haven't considered any net external horizontal force, so that should drop out. But I do have to apply them at each end because that's important to the rotation of the system. So for static equivalence, I need to have terms here. I couldn't just have zero axial force or zero horizontal force. So that's the first thing I want to note, that things balance out. The second is that we end up, if you add the two terms for vertical force, the y direction, we get the same net vertical force that we would expect from this problem. So it seems to fit with statics just as we would have expected. Now that we know the nodal forces from the distributed load, we can put that together with the point loads and get the global force vector. The global force vector is going to have nine terms corresponding to a horizontal force, a vertical force, and a moment at each of our three nodes. We're going to add in the terms that come, the nodal force vector that came from the distributed load where I've extended it to include zeros for node three. Then we're going to add to that the point forces that are at the reactions, R1 and R3. Putting those together, we get a global force vector that has point loads and equivalent nodal forces included. And this is what we need to put together our full system equation, KD equals F. We'll do that at the beginning of the next video and then go through the solution process.